We've talked about what makes a strong acid strong, which is the same thing as what makes its conjugate base more stable. We have talked about uh, things that can stabilize a conjugate base. We've talked about the electronegativity of the atom that bears the charge. We reminded ourselves that electronegativity is really about the energy of uh, atomic orbitals on these various atoms. And so when you look at it from that perspective, it's no wonder that HF is so much more acidic than CH3 minus, or I'm sorry, than uh, methane, uh, because if you consider the conjugate base, just the fluoride anion versus CH3 minus, the negative charge is held on a much more electronegative atom in uh, the fluoride ion, and therefore, the conjugate, its, its conjugate acid is more acidic. Uh, remember that um, when we say more acidic, uh, we mean that its conjugate base is more stable and therefore less basic. Um, but I don't really like that, and so maybe we'll go less reactive. Um, happier, though I don't really like happier either because fluoride can't feel. Um, all right, so electronegativity is one thing that can stabilize a conjugate base. Uh, the other application of this was, of course, our consideration of hybridization of the atom that bears the negative charge, where we thought about alkynes versus alkanes, pKa of 50 versus pKa of 25. And the deal is that the atom in the conjugate base that bears the negative charge is sp3 hybridized for the alkane, sp hybridized for the alkyne. And we've decided that the more s character that a hybrid orbital has, the lower in energy it is, and therefore the more stable the conjugate base should be. Uh, you can also think of sp hybridized carbons as being more electronegative because as far as we're concerned, electronegativity really comes from orbital energies anyway. All right. Anything on that? Yes. Just verifying. So the like, less s character, you're supposed to look at the conjugate base for that or the acid? Um, either. Okay. Yeah. So the, the question is with this s character issue, do I look at the conjugate base? or the acid, either one will, will work. Notice that for these uh, conjugate bases, the atoms that bear the negative charge are still surrounded by the same number of groups. That is, for the, for the conjugate base of the alkane, that carbon is still tetrahedral and still sp3 hybridized, whereas that one would still be linear and sp hybridized. So yeah, in that case, it doesn't, it doesn't matter which one you, you draw. Um, and, and as an item of review, we're going to generally think about acidity by focusing on the stability of the conjugate base because we have a lot of ways of thinking about how to stabilize extra electron density. Um, and as I said in, in the last hour, uh, if, if you need a mantra for your various mindfulness endeavors and you've, you've gotten tired of using the nucleophile attacks electrophile one and, and, and also the homo attacks lumo, your new one can be draw the conjugate base. Say, you know, deep breath, draw the conjugate base, breathe out. Um, because when, when questions ask you why is this more acidic than this, chances are to get the answer you're gonna need to draw the conjugate bases and compare them. Yeah. If the conjugate base is stable, does that mean the acid is unstable? Well, yes, though stability and instability are relative, right? So yes, relative to the alkane, the alkyne proton is more acidic and more reactive or perhaps even less stable. However, relative to uh, HF, the alkyne is crazy not acidic, right? So it's a, it's a comparison thing. Yeah. Dr. Pace, 
Yes. They're asking questions, but you can't hear them. Okay. So if there are questions, I'm, the audio is not coming through. So if you could put them in the chat and then TAs who are moderating can um, sort of stop me and help me uh, answer the questions. One of them is... There's been a lot, and Emma's done a good job of responding to that. Brennan the Brave rides in on his horse to save the Zoom refugees. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Zoom, ref Zoom, Zoom fugees. Um, okay, can you come up with any... Can you do an example of drawing the conjugate base? Yeah. Um, so... What if I were to tell you that, did we do this one? We sort of did this one last time, didn't we? One of these is more acidic than the other and then asked you why, giving you pKa values for the protons that are highlighted. It may not be apparent to you why one is more acidic than the other at this stage, but if you draw the conjugate base, you can start to look at differences between the two. So you might start by asking, okay, is there a difference in the atom that bears the negative charge? Well, they're both oxygen, so there's not a difference in electronegativity. Is there a difference in size? Because last time we talked about how larger anions tend to spread the electron density out through space more and be more stable, which is why we said HI is more acidic than HF. But in this case, Negative charge is held on the same kind of atom, so no difference in size. Is there a difference? Now that you've drawn the conjugate base, you maybe would notice that you could draw a resonance structure that would put the negative charge in the conjugate base on multiple atoms, on another oxygen. Okay? So that would be the explanation why acetic acid is more acidic than ethanol because its conjugate base, the conjugate base of acetic acid is resonance stabilized, whereas the conjugate base of ethanol is just a localized negative charge. Okay, uh, let's see what else. Anything else on the, on the chat? that people want me to address? There was, can you draw, can you get, come, up, come up with an example of drawing the conjugate base? Are we okay? They're worried about what, what study guide drawing that stuff. Oh, okay. Um, right, I didn't address that. Thank you folks at home for asking what study guides are going to be on the test. I had originally planned for us to cover everything through chapter four on this exam. We have today and uh, and three more lectures, including Monday's lecture, and however far we get to will be what is on the test. I anticipate that will be all of the MO theory stuff, all of the chapter two acid base stuff, uh, and probably all of chapter three, probably not very much of chapter four. If we do some of chapter four, it won't be all of it, and I will uh, make it clear what subjects in chapter four will be on the exam and what won't but I won't know that until uh, later this week. Okay. So, uh, resonance delocalization is one way that you can stabilize a conjugate base. Um, let's do just a few more examples with differences. We talked about the size issue last time, right? I spent the stupid a stupid amount of class time drawing SpongeBob, I remember. So we're good on size, okay. Um, all right, so let's do a few examples comparing acids and bases, uh, or rather comparing acidity of various compounds. So let's compare this uh, alkane with pKa50 to this uh, ketone with the proton adjacent to the ketone uh, pKa20. All right, we draw the conjugate base. <clears throat> What's the difference? Well, they're both held on carbons. So not a huge difference in electronegativity. If you look at the starting materials, I guess they're you know, both sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen bonds. 
Uh, is there any other difference you can notice between these two? Resonance, okay. When you see a lone pair, you wanna look for opportunities for resonance, and the way you do that is you look for adjacent pi bonds. So, what can I do with this lone pair to generate a resonance structure? Make it a pi bond and send a pi bond to the opposite. And then put the pi bond, make, it a, make this lone pair a pi bond and then put the carbon oxygen pi bond out onto the oxygen that gives us this molecule. Okay, so we have resonance stabilization here. We have localized negative charge. This is the more stable conjugate base, and therefore the, its acid is, is stronger. Um, what if I asked you to compare this situation with the ketone with an analogous one, only we have a CH2 here instead of an oxygen? we could draw the conjugate base, which would also be resonance stabilized, but the pKa of this proton is actually around 30 instead of 20. What's the difference? Of what? Electronegativity of? of carbon versus oxygen. So you wanna look at the atoms that bear the negative charge in the conjugate base. In the case of the conjugate base of the ketone, you're sharing it between carbon and oxygen. In the molecule below, you would be sharing it between carbon and carbon. There's an electronegativity difference. So uh, sometimes multiple factors can tr contribute to why one molecule is more acidic than the, another. Both of these are resonance stabilized. The difference is one of the atoms uh, on which the negative charge can be in the resonance structures is oxygen up top, but not, uh, but not below. Um, uh, we haven't spent very much time drawing resonance structures in this class. Nevertheless, you can see now that it will be important to recognize situations where resonance uh, can stabilize a conjugate base. One of my favorite questions to ask on an exam, um, I hesitate to do this. I feel like I'm disclosing all of my evil secrets. I am evil, but I will tell you at least what some of the evil is before I do it. Um, nope, maybe. Um, what the heck am I doing? I don't know. Okay, fine. All right, uh, here is an acid and I'll go ahead and erase the proton and we'll draw its conjugate base. And to see whether you've mastered resonance, I have often asked which of the atoms in this structure share the negative charge on that oxygen? Okay, um, so why do I do this? Is it, 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 it is in part because I am evil, but in part it's because no matter what your career is, you're going to encounter a situation where a, that presents itself and you, you haven't quite encountered it before and you're uncertain what to do and you'll be inclined to panic. All right, so uh, I'm first seeing the molecule that I've drawn there, which, oh my goodness, there's a Texas carbon. That's just horrible. Let's try that again. There we go. Um, some of you may be panicking. It feels like the files in your brain are on fire and you don't know what to do and you give up. The challenge will be, can you take a deep breath and rely on what you know and uh, have confidence in it and use it. So, how do we draw resonance structures? Let me show you how not to approach the problem. 
When we drew resonance structures above, we moved a lone pair over that was adjacent to a pi bond. We took one step to move a lone pair over to form a new pi bond. If we stopped there, we'd have too many bonds to carbon, so we then moved a pi bond out onto the oxygen. Two steps, move a lone pair, move a pi bond. Uh, what some people do is they try to combine a lot of steps in one. So they'll say, okay, I could move it here and then move it there. Okay, I've got to remember that I could put it there, but then I could see that I can also do this, and then that would require me to, well, which way do I go now? Do I go here or do I go there? And by, at that point, you've got too many arrows on the page and you're erasing things, and, uh, and then the paper rips, and um, you get angry because now you have to redraw everything. Um, don't do that. Just do the um, lone pair two-step. Okay, and then draw the molecule again. But I don't want to draw the molecule again. What if I make mistakes? Well, go slowly and don't. Just don't make mistakes. <laughs> That's easy to say, right? Just don't make mistakes. Uh, draw slowly and compare and only change what your arrows told you to change. The arrows are the instructions for the next resonance structure. I should have a pi bond between the oxygen and the carbon, and then the adjacent carbon should have the negative charge. And then take a minute to notice something. The negative charge can be on the oxygen or the carbon that's sort of two bonds away, but not on the one in the middle. That's kind of the situation we had for the allyl anion, remember? And part of the reason we said that negative charge could only be on atoms one and three was because the molecular orbitals made it that way. And actually the same is true here. Um, so now you've gotten to that point, you're like, okay, but I'm still not to any of the other options. Options A, C, D, uh, F, and Q are all out here and um, I'm not even there yet. What do I do? Take that lone pair and do another element of the two-step. And all of that involves make a new pi bond and then break the pi bond that you're required to because of the octet rule and move it out onto the other atom that was involved in that pi bond. All right. Now, as we're doing this, you're getting nervous because you're going to look at the clock and think, okay, this is a three-hour test, and we've taken how many minutes on this single question? I can't afford it if we're going to go through it this slowly. Um, have faith because we've just about solved it. Almost done. We have learned that the negative charge can be here or here or there, and a pattern is emerging, right? It's like each of these two steps involves taking the charge, making a new pi bond, and then moving a pi bond to make a new charge. So it's like charge, skip an atom, charge, skip an atom. And that pattern continues all the way through. I could move this lone pair here and move the pi bond there, and that would mean that that atom also shared the negative charge. Oops, I didn't want to. Or I could take these electrons and move them here and then move these electrons there and then this atom would have the negative charge. At this point, I've learned the pattern and all I need to do is alternate atoms and it's done, okay? I didn't draw all the resonance structures, I drew two took the step slowly, now I've got an answer. There's no way, I've seen people try to do this with the multiple arrows all over the place and this and this and this, and, and eventually uh, they get lost and they get it wrong. So don't let that happen to you. Take a deep breath and do, do it systematically like that. Look for the pattern and you can get it right every time, 100%. All right, questions about that? I have drawn bigger molecules than that, by the way. That is not as bad as it gets. Go ahead. So 
would you be asking where the red, the negative charge would be from this question, or what would be? The yeah, the question might be uh, something like, which of the following atoms share the negative charge on the oxygen? And I might have numbered some of these, and so. Um, a and D do, so does F, but not C or Q, right? And so I, I, don't, I don't know exactly how I would format that in terms of multiple choice. There might be a, those, those awful lists you have to choose from, two and three, but not four, and sometimes why. Um, other times I've had multiple response, multiple choice questions where you simply click all the ones that are right. That tends to be bad too, so cornucopia of of suck a cornucopia of suck I'm sorry um, all right what else can we say that word is that a word if, if you're offended by the word I apologize and we can write a list of words I shouldn't say um, all right um, there's Another principle that has to do with spreading out electron density that I think you can get without a lot of time. Um, we're going to compare regular old ethanol with trifluoroethanol. Trifluoroethanol, this proton has a pKa of 12, whereas in regular ethanol, the proton has a pKa of 16. I happen to know that because I've looked it up before. I would give you that information if you needed it or you could look it up. Um, but the question is why? Now, if you draw the conjugate base like you've been taught to do and look at the differences between the two, there aren't a lot. In both cases, the negative charge is held on an oxygen atom. In both cases, there, is, there are no alternative resonance structures. But the difference is these nearby fluoro groups. And the effect of those fluoro groups, because of their electronegativity, is to put partial negative charge out on the fluorines as though each fluorine were tugging on the electron density in the carbon fluorine bond and pulling it toward itself. Uh, we will use a symbol for that. It's the dipole symbol. You may have seen that in general chemistry or it may be unfamiliar to you. The arrow points towards where the, uh, the most electronegative atom, the cross is at the atom that should experience the positive, partial positive charge. So this carbon there would be partially positively charged. Because it's electron deficient, it will itself tug on the electron density in the bond with the adjacent carbon, putting more partial positive charge there, and then that will tug on the electron density in the bond between carbon and oxygen. The effect of this is to smear out the extra electron density in this molecule and pull it towards um, the, the fluoro groups. This is called an inductive effect due to nearby electronegative groups, and it is called an inductive effect because those fluorines induce these polarization of the molecule that pulls the electron density away from the spot that has it in the conjugate base. As you might imagine, this is a distance sensitive kind of effect. Uh, for example, if we put another carbon atom in between uh, the fluoro groups and the oxygen, uh, we would expect this to be probably less acidic than uh, trifluoroethanol, pKa12, but probably still more acidic than regular old ethanol pKa16, but beyond that, if we moved it out further than that, it would start to matter less and less. Okay, Brennan, am I missing anything? Um, nothing. Good? Okay. Um, so there are a few examples in the study guide in the text on that. Um, it's, it's not, it's not, if you answer the reason, the difference between these two, the reason that trifluoroethanol is more acidic than ethanol is electronegativity.
that's an incomplete answer because it's not a difference in the electronegativity of the atom that holds the negative charge in the conjugate base. It's the presence of nearby electronegative groups that pull electron density away from the atom that has the negative charge in the conjugate base uh, through an inductive effect. All right. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, somebody's looking at that and saying, hold on, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so why is there an arrow there? I, I, I realized that as I drew it. I guess I don't mean to communicate that there's now a partial positive on the oxygen, only that this carbon is pulling some uh, electron density away from the oxygen. That is not occurring over here. Uh, that is not occurring when there are no electronegative groups nearby. Um, I guess to illustrate this, we could go to Spartan and draw an alcohol um, and look at its electrostatic potential. Um, green is sort of nonpolar. Uh, red is areas that have a lot of negative charge and um, Blue is areas that have a lot of positive charge. That's, in a lot of ways, the reason this molecule is acidic is because the proton has a fair amount of partial positive charge on it. But uh, I want you to look at this portion of the molecule. That's where the trifluoro group would be. And I want you to look at the intensity of the red on that oxygen uh, and of the blue on that proton because we're going to go back and we're going to just add fluoros here and re-download the data. And what you can see is now the oxygen is way less electron rich and the proton is way more electron poor. And if, uh, unfortunately, this program doesn't do conjugate bases, but if it did, we would see that the oxygen is not as negatively charged in trifluoroethanol's conjugate base as it would be in regular ethanol. Um, okay. Anything else we want to say about that? Okay. So I want to spend a little bit of time telling you where uh, pKa information comes from. Uh, and how to use pKa information to predict the outcome of various acid-base situations, including some that you'll encounter uh, in, in a life science or biochem type of lab. So um, pKa data comes from the comparison of each acid, HA, in terms of acidity with hydronium, H3O+. And... Um, Remember that HA doesn't just dissociate and its proton just flies out into the ether. Instead, in aqueous solution, water steals a proton from HA and you get hydronium and the conjugate base of HA. Uh, this equilibrium has a constant associated with it. Uh, and based on what you know from Gen Chem, you can write out the constant as follows. Hydronium concentration times conjugate base concentration divided by acid concentration times water concentration. Hold on, you say. In general chemistry, we were taught to ignore water uh, because the activity of a pure substance equals one. Um, and I will say, yes, okay, but it really does work. And... Um, what we're going to draw here will become identical to the expression you've had before for acid dissociation constant, which is this. Because concentration of water in a, any aqueous sample is basically 55 molar and is basically constant. You put, you know, 10 millimolar of acid in 55 molar water, the concentration of water does not change uh, to any significant figures that matter to us. And so what we can do is take the concentration of water 
and algebraically put it on the other side of the equation. And I don't like what we did there, so we're going to move some stuff. There we go. Uh, so this allows us to define our acid dissociation constant, which is hydronium concentration times conjugate base divided by concentration of HA. All right. Um, which may be a more familiar form. Um, these Ka values and the Keq values vary over lots of orders of magnitude. And because we are lazy and like to avoid using scientific notation when we can, we're going to use logarithms to make the scale of Ka's more manageable. And because of the uh, relationship that free energy is minus RT natural log of equilibrium constant, we're actually going to use the negative log of Ka so that the trends in Ka will follow trends in free energy. That is, positive numbers mean acid dissociation is unfavorable relative to hydronium. Negative numbers mean acid dissociation is uh, favorable relative to hydronium. So um, we'll define this term minus log Ka as pKa. The reason we call it that is because of its relationship with pH, which you'll see in just a moment. I promised you that the math would be mostly counting and subtraction. Here's a few logarithm things, which I hope you'll forgive me. It, for properties of logarithms are that you can, the log of a product can be the sum of the logs of the individual things. So hopefully it's okay that I've done this. Is that all right? And then of course, minus log of hydronium is just pH. And then if we don't like subtraction, we can actually turn this into log of HA over A minus. Now, that may look familiar to you. That is the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. And in general chemistry, you probably use this to, uh, given the pKa of an acid, to calculate how much of the acid and how much of the conjugate base you would need to get a buffer that had a specific pH. Uh, for example, if you wanted a buffer, uh, a, a sodium phosphate buffer, pH 7.5, this equation could tell you how much of the monohydrogen phosphate versus the dihydrogen phosphate you needed to mix together to get uh, pH 7. And that works, and that's good. But there's another uh, use for this equation that can be even more informative in biochemical and life sciences contexts. And that is because most of the biomolecules we're interested in are present uh, at decently low concentrations in the cell, millimolar or below, and some proteins only micromolar. Um, whereas the buffer in the cytosol and in the serum tends to be much higher than that. And I actually don't know what the concentration of carbonate is in serum. Does anybody know how much carbonate there is in blood? That's the major buffer in blood. This is why you don't want to hyperventilate because that can, if you expel too much CO2, your blood pH uh, starts to change. In any case, biology exists in a buffered aqueous solution and the concentration of the molecules is much lower than the concentration of the buffer. Therefore, the acid-base equilibrium of the molecules is controlled by the buffer pH and not the other way around. In other words, if I have a buffered solution and it's, uh, and it's um, say, 250 millimolar sodium phosphate buffer at pH 7, and I dissolve one micromolar of protein in it, the pH stays the same. But the protonation state, or the acid-base equilibrium of the biomolecule, might be affected by the pH. And I'll show you how you can uh, determine this. <clears throat> All you have to do is subtract pH from both sides of the equation. 
And this tells you that if you have an acid in a buffered solution where the pH is constant, if you subtract pH from pKa, and if that number is greater than zero, that tells you that the HA form, the acid form, dominates. If that number equals zero, that tells you that the concentrations of HA and A minus are equal, because the, the log of one is zero. And then if pKa is less than pH, such that this is a negative number, that means that the conjugate base form dominates. So in aqueous solution, you can think of the pKa of an acid as being the 50-50 point, where this acid exists half in its protonated state, or acidic form, and 50% in its deprotonated state or conjugate base form. Okay, and that, that may be an application of Henderson-Hasselbach that you didn't get in general chemistry, but it's actually pretty useful. Um, let me show you a situation where it becomes important. Um, so let's imagine we have an aqueous solution in a beaker, and let's pretend that the pH is like just seven, because we don't like decimals. And let's imagine we put, we dissolve into this solution some protein. Maybe it's bovine serum albumin or hen egg lysozyme or something. Uh, there are lots of functional groups in proteins, in amino acid side chains that are acidic or have pKa values that are relevant in aqueous solution. As an example, let's consider a side chain with an NH2 group on the end, all right? Um, the NH2 group is interesting because it can exist in a few multiple forms. Here, the R group just means the rest of the molecule. It doesn't refer to anything in specific. Sometimes I will just use a squiggly line to indicate we're just looking at one portion of the molecule. Um, if you remove a proton from the amine form, you get the conjugate base of the amine, which is called the amide. And the pKa for that process is 38. So pretty dang unfavorable. Uh, at pH 7, based on what we said before, which form is more reasonable, amine or amide? Amine, right? 38 minus seven is still a very large positive number which tells you the acid form would dominate. And it's true, there is zero percent of the amide present in aqueous solution. However, and you gotta be careful with this, there are some functional groups that have multiple possible acid-base equilibria. Do you remember learning about H3 o, uh, H3PO4 minus, how there were like two or three different protons that could fall off and they H3PO4, sorry, it wasn't minus. I'm, anyway, there are acids that have multiple protons and the pKa's change as you remove one versus the other. There are some functional groups in OCHEM that are going to be that way too. And indeed, the amine itself is a conjugate base of another protonated form, which is called the ammonium ion. All of this would be available to you on a pKa table, but I've had students work on a problem like this before where I say, uh, what is the charge on this molecule at this pH? What is the formal charge on this molecule at this pH? And they have to look at these groups and decide where the acid-base equilibrium lies. And students, uh, at least a, I don't know whether it's 10 to 15 to 20 percent of students will look at that and tell me, oh, that amino group is neutral at physiological pH because its pKa is 38. But they forgot to consider the other equilibrium that's also relevant at physiological pH 
at physiological pH of 7, 11 minus 7 is still a positive number. So that tells you that the ammonium form dominates there. Okay? Um, so get used to the typical organic functional groups and what kinds of acid-base equilibria they undergo. Um, some of them are easy. Uh, for example, a carboxylic acid. Uh, pKa of a carboxylic acid is generally around uh, 4. Uh, the conjugate base of the carboxylic acid is called the carboxylate. Uh, you don't need to know what things are called, but I will refer to functional groups sometimes in class, and so it may be useful for you to uh, at least be familiar with some of the names. At pH 7, which form should dominate, acid or carboxylate? Go back up to the equation. Four minus seven is a negative number. Therefore, conjugate base form dominates. And yes, at physiological pH, that carboxylate should be negatively charged, just like at physiological pH, the amino group should be NH3+. Okay. Um, uh, the alcohol is another one where there are multiple equilibria possible. The one we think about most um, is the uh, negative, or I'm sorry, the, the neutral alcohol going to negatively charged alkoxide, but there is another one. The alcohol itself is the conjugate base of the positively charged oxonium ion, protonated alcohol, which has a pKa of minus two. So just looking at that, what do you think the major form is at pH seven? Somebody's, somebody's muttering something which starts with al. Alcohol. alcohol, okay. Curtis, you're committing, good. Alcohol is correct. How do you know that? Well, pKa 16 is greater than pH of 7, so that means the, we're not going to get any of the alkoxide, but pKa minus 2 is much less than 7, so that means we're also not going to have any of the oxonium ion. If equations are not your thing and you just want to memorize a phrase, if pKa is greater than pH, then acid form dominates. Okay? All right. Uh, and this, this can be important. At some point in your future, you may be looking at an amino acid sequence and you may be uh, seeing uh, codes for serine or glutamic acid or lysine, uh, which these are the side chains for those things. And you may need to know at a certain pH whether one's positively charged or not. And that may have an important impact on the function of the protein. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, the question is, how do I know it's ammonium and not amine? The, the comparison between 38 and 7 tells you that there isn't going to be any of this, but there should also not be very much of this because this pKa is still, still higher than 7. Yeah. Um, so really none of this and by a factor of 10 to the whatever and very little of this. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's all we have time for. We need a couple more minutes on chapter two, and then next time we'll move on to chapter three.